Welcome to the Success is a Choice podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Beckler. And Dr. Richard A. Johnson joins us today. Dr. Johnson is with the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and he is the director of their Booker T. Washington Initiative. The Booker T. Washington Initiative examines the effects of public policy on African-American communities. Now, Dr. Johnson has been an educator for more than 20 years while also working in both local and state government. Uh, Dr. Johnson has served as the president of the Louisiana Prison Chapel Foundation for nearly two decades, building more than 20 churches inside of prison walls. In addition, he was also co-chair of the Education Committee of the NAACP in Houston. Dr. Johnson grew up in Houston's Fifth Ward and received his bachelor's degree from Wiley College and a master's degree in clinical psychology and a doctoral degree in education administration from Texas Southern University. We look forward to talking with Dr. Johnson today and learning how we can better educate and prepare our young people. So Dr. Johnson, welcome to the show. Hey, Jamie, how are you, man? Thank you so much for having me on with, with you and your audience. I'm looking forward to a lively discussion. I appreciate you joining us. I, I'm so intimidated just, you know, uh, uh, saying your, your bio and saying your introduction, you just, just all the education and all the stuff you've done. I mean, I, I feel like, uh, I feel like I'm not worthy, but, uh, we'll, we'll get through this. I'll, I'll try to, uh, you know, don't, don't use too many big words on me. Uh, come on coach. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You're, you're, a, you're a basketball you're a guy. guy. You're a basketball guy. Wiley college. You played basketball at Wiley college. You also played basketball at, uh, when you were in the all, army yeah i played all army basketball i played wiley uh i tell you what probably the most you know uh exhilarating experience i had in my basketball career i was playing all army and uh and we got down to what we call the all armed forces tournament best out of army navy air force marines and that was in uh 1988 and uh they said, we're going to be, you know, this year, because he just signed his pro contract, uh, this year he's going to play in the Armed Forces Tournament. And I said, David Robinson, they said, yeah, the Admiral. And so we played against David in the All Armed Forces Tournament. Glad to say that we won. Uh, first time Army had won in nine years. And, and the magic uh, to the whole deal was, we all played so far above our games. It was unbelievable. Uh, I, could, I couldn't believe the things that we were able to do. Uh, we was in a whole nother zone. David uh, took us there, but, you know, we, we came out victorious. Well, that's, that's something beating David Robinson. Oh, man. You know, uh, well, of course, we were, we were you know, they were, they were 500 to 1 odds to, on winning and went in the tournament and uh it was just something if it's something for the record books if you ever go back and want to take a look at the all armed forces championship game of 1988 you know i got a chance to live a little bit in that miracle well that's not i i've never seen that on david david uh robinson's resume or his bio i've never i've never quite I don't think seen he that put before. it there <laughs> i don't think david wants to relive that I don't think so. That's, that's a great accomplishment. Great accomplishment. So you're, yeah, you, you've been involved in sports your whole life. You love sports. Uh, you know, you played, uh, college ball, you played army, uh, in the army. That's, that's awesome. We have a lot of coaches, uh, a lot of coaches that listen to this show and, and they're going to be interested in what you have to say just in general, because I mean, you're, you're right there at the forefront of trying to help young people, uh, trying to help educate young people, uh, educate adults on how to educate young people, but essentially just how can you make African-American communities better? You're right there uh, at the forefront of that. And so a lot of the people that are listening to this show is, are going to benefit, I think, from what you have to say today. Yeah. One of the things, Jamie, when I, when I first came out of the military, uh, after, after all army, uh, I came out of the military. I wanted to go back to school and, and earn my master's degree. Uh, I wanted to be somebody in my family that, uh, that, that earned a master's degree. I had already earned a, a bachelor's degree, and I was the first in my family to go that far. And I said, well, look, it'll be great if I could, you know, that, that competitive spirit, you know, it'll be great if I can get a master's degree. I'll be the first in my family to do that. And so when I came back home uh, in the late 80s, there was this thing called crack cocaine that was 
that was ravishing the streets uh, of Houston and, and all major cities. And a couple of had a couple of crack houses on the block that I grew up on. And, uh, and I said, well, I need to figure out how to help my community. And, and the military had set me up where I could use my benefits to go back to college. And, uh, and so I said, well, I'll major in clinical psychology and study chemical dependency, and I'll try to help that way. And so what ended up happening was way led on the way I did that. And then I ended up opening a, a residential treatment facility slash school in Fifth Ward. So it was called the Golden Eagle Leadership Academy. And I had an agreement with the judges that they will only send me the toughest boys in Houston. And I applied all of my military skills, the things that I learned in the military uh, in terms of discipline, waking them up early, taking them out of those sneakers. Everybody wore the same uniforms. And we had, and University of Texas did a study at that time and we had an 86% success rate. But the greatest thing that, that I was able to give them that helped us to basically win the war against drugs on these young men and, 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 and women, mostly young men, was I loved them like my coach loved me. You know, when I was in high school, man, my coach loved me like I was his own son. And so with these boys, I just did the exact same thing. I gave them everything that I had learned because I loved them just like they were my own. And because it was residential, it was a 51 bed facility. So, and I always kept a waiting list. So I always had 51 boys living there on my campus. So it's like a boarding school for boys, for, for tough boys. And I partnered with HPD. The HPD brought us, you know, Christmas gifts the Thanksgiving, all those things, man, the, the fire department, all the first responders. Because again, I've been in the military, so I know how to be a responder. And, 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 and most guys and young women in first responding uh, positions want to help inner city kids. And so we all joined in together and we created this enormous success rate. We would take the boys to Africa, we took them to Europe. We took them to Panama so that their world became bigger than Fifth Ward. You know, once a person is exposed to a bigger world and they can see more, then it's hard to put them back into that little box that they were in before or guarding that little corner that they were on before because they're bigger than that corner now. And so those are the things that, that, that I was able to do. And, and, and I, I've dealt with educators for over the last 30 years. And most people will say, I love the kids. I love the kids. I say, well, if you love them, then love them more. Because if you, if you love them, you'll love them enough to figure it out for them, to create a pathway out of dismal realities into positive learning environments. Now, when I, uh, when I first uh, what discovered you, when I first learned about you, you know, I would expect that, that somebody with, you know, your resume that's a mile long, all these great accomplishments, achievements, all these advanced degrees, that your family, your, your parents were probably professors. Your parents were probably uh, the exception in Houston, and they were the rich people you know, or they were, they, they were living in this great mansion or, you know, you had all the benefits and all the opportunities given to you, but uh, that's not the case. No, no. That's what I tell some of my friends too. Now, you know, they, they were, a lot of my friends were born in a hospital back in that day. They would either be born at St. Elizabeth hospital or Jeff Davis hospital because things were segregated back in the early sixties and late fifties, early sixties. I was born in 61, but my parents, uh, neither of my parents finished eighth grade. My parents came from Louisiana to Houston and uh, came off the farm. And actually I was born in Fifth Ward on Lockwood Drive, but I, was born, I wasn't born in, in, the, in the hospital, St. Elizabeth, I was born in a clinic. So it's like a little bitty, one room place right there on Lockwood Drive is where I was actually born. Um, and, uh, and, but a lot of my friends, what my parents did do for me though, my parents were trades people. 
like a tradesman. My dad drove a truck and my mom, my mom made custom drapes. She learned how to sew and make drapes. So she made custom drapes and my dad drove a truck. What they did do is they put me in a community. We moved from Fifth Ward to Pleasantville. And that was a community where a lot of professional African-Americans lived. And because, because my dad was a soldier too in the Korean War, they had built that community really for, for African-American soldiers. And so he was able to get a home out there, which is only about three miles down the street from Fifth Ward. <laughs> you know, it's a community like three miles down the street. I used to ride my bike over there all the time. But, uh, but the thing of it is, uh, they put us out there and, and a lot of folks in my community were professionals. And so I could see a lot of professionals. If you can see it, you can be it. And my friend David, lived we, he lived down on the corner now his dad was a principal of a high school and his mom was a school teacher and uh but david loved he loved uh metal shop and he loved drafting and i was looking around and because my parents had not accelerated in school and college or anything like that i was saying i have to go to college i have to get a degree Look at these people. I got to do something. I got to get a degree. David grew up in the house with his mom and dad were both degree people who lived down the street from me. And, uh, and so David, Hughes Tools at the time had a program, uh, a co-op program at Fur High School. And, and David participated in that as an intern. So for the folks who took drafting, they were taught how to design drill bits. And when they went to metal shop, they were taught how to make the drill bits. So when Dave, we graduated the same year, David graduated and went to work for Hughes Tools, making a high salary. I went to college to play basketball. And uh, my second year when I came home, uh, my sophomore year, I came home for Christmas and I put my stuff down and I, I ran down to David's house and knocked on the door. I said, hey, Ms. Raybon, I'm here to see David. I'm, I'm home from college. She said, well, David, David's at home, but he's not here. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, David's bought his first home. I said, David bought a house? Are you kidding? And she said, well, I'll call him. So she calls David up and David said, hey, man, stay there. I'm going to come over. So he comes over in a brand new customized van. This was in the 80s, man, you know. Now, this is in the 70s. Yeah, he comes over in a brand new customized van. And my old hoopty, you know, I could see the, 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 the street through the floorboard. You know, I'm trying not to stick my foot in the wrong place. Otherwise, it's going to be dragging the concrete. I looked at David and said, man, something told me I should have went to metal shop. <laughs> but, you know, Back then, man, we believed in the trades and we had our schools had collaboration with industry. And so jobs were plentiful. Skills were given to us in the, in the high school level uh, before they took it out of high school and moved it to community colleges. And we, we fight that battle now getting CTE. It used to be called vocational education. Now it's CTE, career technology education back into the high schools, paid internships back into the high schools. We're fighting for those bills. Uh, to get these young boys off the street, if you, can, if you can give them a skill and provide pay while they learn, uh, that'll, that'll, that'll take away what they're doing on the street. I stopped a couple of young guys one day, a gang of them really, and I asked them if, if they were able to make money doing something honest, the same amount of money, equal to or more, would they put down what they were doing on the streets, which was selling drugs? And they looked at me and they said, Dr. Johnson, I don't have to make the same amount of money. It could just be close. I just want to do it. Uh, if I can get an honest job, I'd do it. This is what I got right now. They're not going to put that down unless we give them something else to pick up. And so that's why we were fighting at Texas Public Policy Foundation for the paid internship and paid apprenticeship bill uh, that got caught up uh, in the Senate and didn't make it out in time. Uh, but hopefully we're, we're going to bring that fight back again and I'll be able to do a slam dunk on it like I did 
I didn't do it all day, but I just did a round day. <laughs> <laughs> If you'd like to read or you have a special athlete or coach in your life, then you'll want to check out The Bus Trip. This modern-day sports leadership fable might be a work of fiction, but the issues and solutions provided are very real and can help teams develop a winning culture. The Bus Trip helps athletes learn how to be better teammates and more positive leaders. The fictional book presents practical ideas on how teammates can hold each other accountable while reminding each other of their goals. Please visit thebustripbook.com for more information, chapter discussion guides, and team discounts. Once again, that website, thebustripbook.com. Well, you're the director of the Booker T. Washington Initiative, uh, part of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And I'm a huge quote guy. I love quotes. I know that you like quotes as well. So what I want to do for the next couple minutes, this is a little different but I want to give you a couple Booker T Washington quotes and, and I want you to kind of go with it, however you want to go with it. Uh, okay. So, so uh, I, these are a couple quotes I really like of Booker T Washington's and you can kind of go with it. However you think the educators, the coaches listening to this, uh, what they might want to hear about that quote, because Booker T Washington, amazing person did so much. Right. I mean, the, there's a reason there's an Institute. There's a reason that we still know his name and stuff. So I want to first start off with the one that, that has success in it because I love success. I love defining <laughs> success. So Booker D. Washington said success is to be measured, not so much by the position that one has reached in life, but by the obstacles, which he has overcome. Absolutely. It's the process. You know, it's the process that 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 makes us who we are. Uh, if you look back on my wall, it's not the degrees. It's the process that I had to go through to achieve those degrees um, that really makes us the success. And it's the hard work that you put in. Booker T. Washington uh, believed in self-reliance, independence, freedom. Of course, he was a great entrepreneur, uh, great educator. Uh, and also a, a great collaborator, a great team guy. Nobody would have figured Booger T. Washington to team up with uh, Julius Rosenthal, at, who at the time, you know, was, was one of the wealthiest guys in the world because he owned Sears and Robot. And he and Julius, C. Rosen, Julius Rosenthal got together and, and built 5,000 schools across America in rural areas, poor areas that would help educate Americans. And uh, Booker T. Washington was the idea behind that. Julius Rosenthal was the resources and the money behind it. But Booker T. Washington, uh, right now, if you look at Tuskegee University, Tuskegee University is a thriving university, not just because, you know, it's, a, an, it's an HBCU, but because it is, at, among the HBCUs, it has the largest amount of land mass. It has 5,000 acres. And it's the 12th largest university in America for land mass. So if you own land, you own wealth. So basically, Booker T. Washington was a man way, way, way ahead of his time. And uh, for 59 years, this is what we see that have come out of that one individual. Booker T. Washington lived to be 59, you know. And during his time, you know, both him and W.B. Du Bois were, were thought to be the, the thought leaders of those times. But Booker T. Washington's ideals and principles have withstood the test of time and it's because of the process. Well, kind of related to collaboration is sometimes we'll have to work with people we don't maybe totally agree with, or we're going to have to work in a situation that, that isn't perfect, isn't ideal. And he said, Booker T. Washington said, we should not per permit our grievances to overshadow our opportunities. Vision. Vision. Booker T could see beyond the moment. Most people, Jamie, most people live within the moment. Most people are single dimensional thinking individuals. 
Booker T. Washington was a multidimensional thinker that could see far beyond the moment and then grasp the, the, the vision of the future in terms of, of, of what he wanted to achieve in, as a goal. Athletes do that a lot. They just don't know they're doing it. Athletes, really, they don't. They don't. Can you imagine? Look at Michael Jordan, man. Can you imagine the precision? I tell you what, let's bring it up closer. Look at Steph. Look at Steph. Steph Curry, right? Steph shoots the ball 30, 40 feet away from the goal, just like he's standing underneath the goal with that kind of accuracy, right? Yeah. Now, now, can you imagine, you know, really the, the symmetrics and going, leaving his hand and the ball rotating for 30 to 40 feet in the air and going through this little hoop every time almost. I mean, that's seeing way beyond the moment, man. You know, these guys, they just don't know it. Booker T could see that with, with life experiences. His main thing was, Booker T's main thing is, look, you're going to learn liberal arts and sciences, but you're also going to learn how to build a house. What most people don't really know, you have to have some skill. I have different skills, man. I mean, there's, there's, I can do, as long as God keeps me in good health, I used to work at the waterfront. I mean, I can do a whole lot of other things outside of write poetry and, 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 and write studies. You know, because if nobody buys my poetry and nobody hires me to do any studies, one of these days I may have to go back and, and grab a, a hammer and a nail and, and do some real, you know, skilled work. So Booker T was in that line of thinking that you need to know how to build your own communities. And most people don't know that 90% of the buildings at Tuskegee were built by the students at Tuskegee. Yeah, you know, so this was the mind of Booker T. Washington. You know, right now we have so many young men and women, boys and girls coming out of high school with no skill that's marketable. And at the same time, many of them are not college, what we call college ready. So if you're not college ready and you don't have a skill, what are you going to do? You're going to go out in the streets where you can do that little skill, you know, it's real easy, stand on the corner and sell dope. But here's what we have to do as educators. We have to begin to see the whole, the holistic reasoning behind education in America. The foundation of education in America is to provide America with a highly trained, highly skilled workforce, that's it. Whether it's in medicine, law, construction, you know, IT, it doesn't matter. That's the whole meaning of education, not for everybody to go get a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, or a doctor's degree, but it's to train highly skilled plumbers, electricians, air conditioning, construction, uh, IT, all those areas that don't require a two or four year degree. Well, the next quote, uh, Booker T said this, but I, I can never, ever see this word without thinking of Martin Luther King, who I know uh, uh, you place right up there on a pedestal. I mean, you're a huge fan, but it says character, not circumstances, make the man. I can never no see the word character without thinking Martin Luther King. No, no question, man. You know, character is the key. Character. We're all going to be faced with circumstances. I mean... I was tested when I went to the military. What, what happens when you go through basic training in the military is you're pushed beyond your limits. You're tested beyond your limits. And it's designed that way. And it's designed that way to number one, identify your character and number two, build your character. And, and that's what Martin did say about his kids. He wanted them to be known and judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content, the content of their character. And, and that's where we ought to be working in the character building business as educators. 
as coaches, as athletes, man. You know, my coach built so much character in me, you know, when he would say, look, I want you to play center because you can jump high. Well, I wanted to just be a, a, a forward. And I said, because, you know, for a 6'4", six, 6'5", six, center at that time, we had guys, I was playing against guys that was 6'10", 6'11", 7' foot. And, uh, and he said, I want you to practice on a hook shot. I hadn't even shot a hook. I, I, I didn't any work on a hook shot. But you know what? He knew my character. And he knew that I would do it and that I would learn how to do it well. I became a 6'5 hook shot shooting character, man. You know, but but those are the things that that sports builds character. You know, the military certainly builds character. You go through the military, it's going to test you at every level. And adversity builds character. You know, Martin also said it's not how well a man does in times of leisure and comfort, but how, how well does he perform when he's stressed at his most stressful moment? How well will I break down and hate my brother because I'm in a stressful moment? Or will I rise above that? That was Booker T. That was, that was, that was Martin. That was also Frederick Douglass, man. Frederick Douglass, I mean, you know, when he convinced Lincoln to create the fighting 54th Infantry, you know, of African-American soldiers to go and help fight for freedom, he said to Lincoln he wanted to join the 54th. Lincoln said, you're too important to me. So Frederick put both of his sons in, and both of his sons fought, you know, for liberty. So... These guys were giants in character, in content, in character. That's what I strive to be. Yeah, every day I, I, I let my son, my 11-year-old, off at school. And, and the two things I tell him, well, I, I say I love him, but the two other things I tell him is be a good leader today and be kind to everybody, even if they're not kind to you. And I always put that second part in because I'm always trying to teach my 11 year old, it doesn't matter the circumstances, you can always control how you react to something. And that respect and kindness is more of a sign of your character than it is the other person. Exactly, exactly, man. You know, I, you know, I grew up in a time where, you know, my community, folks think that the world is violent now. I think the world has pretty much always been violent. You know, it's how we deal with, how we deal with certain violence, certain areas. Uh, you know, there was two things that I focused on and this is what I tell my boys now, you know, two things. Number one, stay alive. And number two, stay free. Now, anything that, that you see that's gonna jeopardize your life or your freedom, stay away from it, go the other way. My dad used to tell me, my dad, my dad served in the Korean War. He was in the 1st Cavalry. He drove a tank. But, you know, and my dad was not the kind of guy, you know, he wasn't a pushover by far. You know, he's a straight blue-collar worker. Uh, but he used to tell me all the time, he said, look, it's better to walk away from a fight, you know, and, and so, than to stand there and die for nothing. And he says, says, he used to say this, he say, it's better say there he went than there he lay. <laughs> so, so, uh, you know, I would, I would walk where he say, you see, he said that it's going to be sometimes that you, they're not going to let you walk away. Then you have to defend yourself. But if you can try to see if you can walk away from it. And that's been my, my, my theory over life. Um, and that's, that's helped to save my life in my own community is knowing when I can walk away and, uh, and not say, I'm going to stand my ground and then be underground. <laughs> well, you mentioned Frederick Douglass, uh, a few minutes ago, and, and I use one of his quotes constantly with coaches and educators that, that I work with. Uh, it's easier to raise up a, a strong children than it is to repair broken men, you know, start them yeah. early. 
you know, get, you know, don't wait till they become, you know, set in their ways or they become, you know, have all this baggage. We had yeah. an awesome, awesome opportunity to build up the future husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, business people, educators, leaders in our community. What are some things that we need to be doing as, as teachers, as coaches, even parents right now, raising up uh, this next generation, whether they're white or, or black. I, I know that, you know, your, your mission, you, you deal with, you know, the African-American communities, public policies, mainly for that, but just in general, what do we need to be doing? We need to raise good people, man. You know, we, we need to raise good people and we need to raise good patriots. I mean, America is a great country, Jamie. It's a great country. I've been around the world. Uh, I was in the military for eight years. So I traveled a lot. I've seen a lot of different con countries and cultures. America ranks way above by far every country I've been in, in terms of the people. It's the spirit of America, but we can't allow individuals who, who are short-sighted with little to no experience to begin to define America as a, a bad place, a negative place, a, a, a racist place. We cannot do that because we know better. We know, my grandfather used to say that all the time, I know better. <laughs> And he was in World War I, but you know, I come from a military family. But the thing of it is, what we need to do is start young. Start with our kids when they're young. Most of our kids don't know the First Amendment. Most of our kids don't know the Constitution. You know, I carry these little pocket-sized constitutions around. So I want people to understand here's the rule books of America. You know, if you understand the rules, when they taught me the rules of basketball, man, I could play, I could do some remarkable things within 94 feet. Long as I stayed inside the 94 feet and I don't step on the out-of-bounce line or step out of bounds, I'm good to go. But I knew the rules. When you don't know the rules of the game, then what you do is you, you shrink back, you start hating this and hating that, and you don't, you, don't, you, you don't go here or there because you think it's impossible, but you just don't know the Constitution. If you know the Constitution and you know the Bill of Rights and you know the Declaration of Independence, then you become really aware of the freedom that you have as an American. I love being free, man. Um, but we have to teach that. That's what I do with my kids right now. They have a pocket constitution, man. My, 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 my little ones, you know, my older ones, they got it, you know, way back in the day, but now my little ones are getting it. And, and I asked them, you know, tell me what the 13th amendment is, you know, do you know what the 13th amendment is? Then I, I drill them on those things as a parent. You know, but my my parents taught me, again, my dad was in First Cav, my grandfather was in World War I. So my, my, my parents and grandparents taught me patriotism and to love America and also to serve America and to serve humanity. I learned that from my parents. So we as parents, teachers, we have to love our kids enough to give them the right information necessary for them to be well-rounded citizens and human beings. We have to love them enough. Well, looking at uh, the rules, you, you talk about the rules. Let's look at it from a, a slightly different perspective. What about the people that say the rules, the, the game is rigged? The, the rules of the game are, are fixed or they're, they're holding me back from being successful or, uh, you know, we, we talked earlier about uh, one of Booker T. Washington's quotes, you know, character, not circumstances makes the man. Well, sometimes the circumstances hold me back. It keeps me from getting this degree or doing this. What would you say to that? Well, I, I'd rather I'd rather show you a sermon than, 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 than to give you a sermon any day. I'd rather you see it, you know, I mean. I grew up, I was, I, I was born in 1961, so I was born in a clinic which was in an all-black community in Fifth Ward. 
And um, and I grew up in an all black community and I went to an all, all black church and I went to historically black colleges and universities. Um, but I was able to achieve because I had community support. I had people around me. I had family support. Just about everybody I know have a community around them. You have to find the ones who are supporting you and doing the right things. I also had a lot of, I had a lot of support to go sell dope too, but I didn't do it. I had a lot of support to hang out on the street and shoot dice too, but I didn't do that. You see, but I, I was around that every single day of my life. Every single day of my, I was around fights every single day of my life. But my dad told me, if you can walk away, walk away. Only time you stand up is if you can't walk away, then you have to turn around and fight. There was a couple of times I did have to do that. But most of the time I could figure out how to get away from it because they, my parents knew the environment they were raising me up in. You know, people see it, they know it. I mean, these things are happening. People are getting shot all around you. That Those things are happening. But the thing about it is, <clears throat> never say you can't because can't does not work for, I'm a very religious person, the God I serve. You see, because God may, may say not now, it doesn't mean no. Sometimes I got some not nows, but I kept going. It was a test of my faith. And so we have that in our communities. We have that in our families. What I would say to individuals who say that they can't and that life circumstances won't allow them, I would say, look deeper. Look deeper. And then use the human capital around you. Because you have, all of us have human capital all around us. There's some good folk out there that's whispering, you can do it. Jamie, you can do it. But then the bigger voice might say, no, you can't do it, man. You need to hang out over here. Forget what they're saying. But look, Support, follow the voices that support your dreams. And those voices will be enough. Even if it's a whisper, follow the voices that support your dreams. And you can be lifted up out of poverty. You can be lifted up out of your circumstance, your dismal circumstances, and have the courage to look forward. No horse wins a race looking back. Look forward. So so uh, I'm hearing you definitely are anti victim mentality you definitely don't yeah. want any victim no. mentality around here no I, no <laughs> absolutely man i mean can you imagine me going to my coach with a victim can, can you imagine that i mean you know i remember one time and i'm gonna, I'm gonna give you this my coach i you know we had played a game and uh here in houston and, and we lost a game we were playing in the jc tournament and my coach let everybody go out of the dressing room. He said, you stay back, Richard, for a minute. And I, I think I scored eight points in that game. And uh, and it was me and, and Scott. And he said, you two stay back. I was playing center. Scott was playing forward. He said, you two stay back. He says, look, we can. this team cannot win without the two of you being in double figures. Figure it out. It doesn't matter. You all cannot score less than 10 points a game. We cannot win unless you do that. And, and like I told you, my dad was like, my, my, my coach was like a second father. My mind went right then. I'm going to do it. Whatever it takes to score more than 10 points a game because my team needs that. So, I mean, we, we, don't, we don't live in a victim world, man. You know? Victims cannot succeed in this world because one, some folks told me when they said is excuses are tools of incompetence. And those who use them are seldom good at anything. And so we cannot use excuses. We cannot be victims. We have to be victors. And when I look at Frederick Douglass, I look at Booker T. Washington, I look at Du Bois, I look at Martin Luther King, you know, all these folk, man, you know, Harriet Tubman, I look at all these folk. What if they decide, look, I'm just going to be a victim and lay down? Would we be where we are today? 
The answer is no. So we stand on their shoulders and I dare to embarrass them by being a victim. Yeah, we just uh, we just did a podcast on Harriet Tubman, and and I mean, here's a short black woman, uneducated, in the 1800s. It doesn't get any lower on the status chart, probably, than that. Right. And yet, right. she's one of the greatest leaders of all time. She led people and influenced right. people, and they respected her, and she made so many lives better. Uh, but she had no status. She had no official title or power. No, but a giant of a spirit, a giant of a spirit, man. And, and, and that comes, I'm going to tell you that that comes from God. That's divine. You know, when, when you open up your spirit and, and God breathes into your spirit, certain things that you should do or accomplish or help humanity along the way. I mean, Martin, Martin was risen way above Martin King. You know, he, I mean, when they asked him to lead the, 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 the movement, he didn't want to do it. He didn't think he was good enough to do it. But when God breathed into Martin that spirit, he was the right guy for the right time. And God always picks the right people for the right time, you know, but it's bigger than, than the individual. You know, every now and then in life, Jamie, ordinary people get to do extraordinary things. You know, when, when Dr. J, I mean, I was a big Dr. J fan, man. You know, a matter of fact, I watched J, I watched the doctor's last game and cried. I said, it's over for basketball, man. <laughs> this is the end of an era. We're done. The doc is out. The doc is retired. Man, it's all over. Then here comes Michael Jordan doing remarkable things. And then when Michael Jordan time goes, then here comes Kobe Bryant, you know? So God has people who will do remarkable things, man. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And, and that's what the spirit of, of, of man can do. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good stuff. I, I appreciate that. Uh, we hear it all the time in the media right now. We're inundated by race relations, social justice. Lots of coaches, lots of educators are, are dealing with this on a daily basis. Obviously, this is this is part of our fabric to a degree, or it's it's it, it, we're we're we can't escape this. What would you say? Uh, how should we go about? dealing with race relations, dealing with social justice, uh, especially from an educator point of view, from a coach point of view, how, how do we educate our students? How do we get educated ourselves? Uh, how can we make the world a better place uh, in the times that we're, we're living in, the, today's day and age? I'm gonna tell you something and, 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 and you're gonna think about it. really, the way to deal with it is to try to educate without race. I had an experience, my son, we were out in, in the backyard sitting down by the pool, my oldest son, and he's a, he's a computer guy and he, he's a gamer. He designed these games. He's a coder. He designed games and he's going through this thing and we're sitting out talking. And it dawned on me that my kids grew up in a multicultural community where we had people from different countries all over on, on this side of the block, on that side of the block. It just didn't matter, right? But when I grew up, I grew up in a community with all black people, you know, wasn't no other, other cultures in my community. And so I asked him, I said, you know, his name is Richard also. He's Richard the fourth. I said, Rick, man, uh, you know. I said, I grew up in a, and I, I went, I grew up in an all black community and I went to all black school. I said, but well, you grew you grew up in a, a multicultural community, multicultural school. I said, you know, what do you think the difference is in the experiences, right? And so he stopped for a moment. He was dealing with his little gadgets. He stopped for a moment and I could see his mind working. You know, he, he went into like instant deep thought. And after about 35 seconds, he looked at me and he said, dad, 
I said, what, what, what's your thoughts, man? He said, I have no reference, man. He said, I have no reference. And then I thought about Martin. When Martin said, not the color of my skin, but the content of their character. See, Richard didn't have any thought. He had never experienced being in an all black situation or he never experienced white or black. His friends were different cultures. Some of them were white, some of them were from India, some of them were from Africa, some of them were from Germany, you know. And, and as an as a information systems guy, he, he basically works with people all over the world. He had no reference. But my point to that is, what we achieved in 1964 in the Civil Rights Movement with the Civil Rights Bill, in 1965, the Voting Rights Act, what we achieved was what Martin and the movement was fighting for. And that was to remove race out of the equation. Now we have individuals want to put race back into the equation. What we have to do now is uplift the civil, the gains of the civil rights movement in 1964 and 65. Because they worked, they gave their lives. Martin gave his life mm -hmm. to remove race from the equation. Abraham Lincoln gave his life. He was assassinated to remove race from the equation. They were all fighting to remove race from the equation. So who are we now to stand on their shoulders and allow race to be placed back into the equation of human development in our schools, in our education systems? I was one of the first groups to go to get bus from over to Fur High School. All of prior to me, my older sister then went to Wheatley, Phyllis Wheatley High School. In Fifth War, we were bused over to Fur High School. Why? Because they wanted to remove race from the equation by putting African Americans and white students together. And guess what? Over time, it was. So how then do we allow the miracle that God placed in those strong fighters for humanity to be washed away and we put race back into the equation? If you can e remove race, my, my advice, you asked me on the question, my advice, what I do as a teacher, as an educator, as an athlete, is to fight to remove race from the equation. And when I came home from the military, from the army, the first thing I did was open up Golden Eagle Leadership Academy in our community. And then I dealt with the judges to only give me the toughest boys in town. And I started out with all African-American boys. Then after, after a couple of years, it was everybody, every race of people. It just didn't matter. All I wanted was the tough boys and give them something that would redirect their behavior. It's not about race, man. If we can move our folk away from that and focus in on the content <laughs> of the character of individuals, then we, we've earned a spot to stand on the shoulders of King, Douglas, Booker T. Washington, Du Bois, all of them, Harriet Tubman, all of them. We've earned a right, but we lose that right when we go against what they fought so fervently for and gave their lives for. Well said. Content of character worry about the content of character, uh, make ourselves better, make the people around us better. Dr. Richard A. Johnson, uh, you can follow him, uh, texaspolicy.com, texaspolicy.com on Twitter. You can follow the Texas, uh, you can follow the Texas Public Policy Foundation at TPPF, TPPF on Twitter. And we'll put those in the show notes too. So you don't have to drive off the road while you're listening to this, trying to write that down. So we'll put that in the show notes as well. But Dr. Richard A. Johnson, great insights. Uh, guys, we'll put some, we'll link some articles as well in the show notes. Go check those out. He's on the front lines every day, 
working to make the African-American community better, uh, but in general, trying to make the world a better place. So we appreciate your investment in people's lives, investment in this world, investment in you know leadership and trying to make things better. So thanks so much for joining us and thanks for all you do. Thank you so much for having me, Jamie. And God bless your heart, man. Keep moving and keep, keep winning. Let's get some slam dunks and win. Success. Success is a choice. Choose success today. Thanks, buddy. Thanks so much for tuning into the show today. We really do appreciate it. We love doing this podcast, and we hope that you love listening to our variety of guests each week. Success leaves clues, and whether you're a coach, an administrator, educator, leader, entertainer, or a business person, there's probably something you can learn from another person's stories, and we love bringing you those stories each week. The currency for a podcast are ratings and reviews, and we really do appreciate all of you that have taken the few seconds to go over to Apple or wherever you listen to podcasts and leave us a nice little five-star rating. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. It means so much to us and helps us to keep doing the show. Thanks again. And until next time, remember that success is a choice. What choice will you make today?